Good morning and welcome to Resilient You with Alicia Pisani. On our show, we talk about topics of resilience, and today I'm so excited to welcome Yvonne Sandemir. Yvonne uh, is an author uh, with a very special book, um, and as well, she has a lot of different things going for her, which I'm so excited to welcome you, Yvonne. Welcome to the show. Hi, Alicia. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad that we were finally able to find a time and a date to sit down and do this. We've been both trying to do this for a while. I'm so happy to be here. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yvonne, let's, um, let me ask you, where would you like to start um, to tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? I, I would love to hear it from your perspective. Sure, sure. <clears throat> so uh, you mentioned I'm I'm author. I'm author of my memoir, The Invisible Girl, which deals with my own childhood trauma of child sexual abuse, incest, and basically childhood trauma in every way that you can imagine. And um, during the process of writing my story, I decided that, you know, I need to raise awareness to these issues because it's not just my story. It's the story of more than 42 million other adults out there um, that have been sexually assaulted, et cetera. Um, so from there, I said, how can I make a difference? And so I decided to start my own podcast. So now I'm have my own podcast that I'm doing every other Wednesday. It's a live podcast on Fireside, which is, it's interesting. It's kind of a, it's a new platform. I know it's new to me, um, but it's cool because you can come on and you can actually interact with our guests. You can come on video or just audio and join the conversation. And so it's, I'm hoping that as time goes on, it will reach more and more people and more and more people will be willing to come on my show and share their stories of overcoming their own childhood trauma. And so I've kind of made it my mission over the past couple of years to really just get the word out. I, you know, I want to spread awareness about child sexual abuse. You know, people need to know what the statistics are. They need to know what some of the signs and symptoms are that their child or a child that they know has already been abused or is currently being abused. So important because the long-term after effects that the victims live with for the rest of their lives um, is so impactful. I'm 43 years old and I still just about every night have nightmares, vivid nightmares that cause me to talk in my sleep and scream in my sleep. And it's come to the point where I'm recording them because it's helping me kind of process these nightmares and really what nightmares are. It's really telling you things that you need to address. Now, that's a very br broad statement. I am not a dream specialist or anything, but for myself, I'm finding it helpful to record those episodes. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and I'm also, and so from the long term, excuse me, long term after effects, we want to go to, which is the main mission is how do we prevent this from happening to our children and the children around us? How do we prevent this? And, there are ways, and I'll give you a little bit of a hint. It starts right inside the home. <laughs> it starts right with um, our toddlers when they're old enough to run up and hug a family member that if they say, no, I don't want to hug, or if they in, you know, indicate that they're, they don't want to be physical, that we don't force them to do that, that we respect their boundaries. And so it starts as early as that. And so... You know, that's really my mission and why I wanted to join you today to answer your questions and gain more of an audience because it's so, so important that we, you know, raise awareness to the fact that child sexual abuse can be prevented. And I know that's a very strong statement, 
you know, to say the word prevent is very strong, but you can prevent this by knowing all the signs and symptoms, by knowing what you can do as a parent or a caregiver to protect your child and ensure they have the correct boundaries. So from my memoir, my podcast, I am planning on writing two children's books, which I haven't quite started yet, um, that I'm very excited about. But one will be about boundaries, teaching children where the good places and the bad places are, basically, but in, you know, a more creative way for, <laughs> for children. And the second will be for parents on how to create those boundaries with their children, how to prevent it. So I'm very excited about those two things. But right now my focus is my memoir, The Invisible Girl, and my podcast, Survivor Strong, which you were a guest on, by the way. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, yeah. I want to go back and, and listen and watch that one again. Um, Yvonne, so your your memoir is actually your life story and telling your trials and tribulations of dealing with your own childhood trauma. So first off, I just want to say thank you so much for putting it out there. We, you know, I know that we've shared some stories um, of what people have come up to us and, and opened up and just, it's amazing the hope that we can provide through doing this. Um, with, when, when people are try, when people have experienced a trauma, the, it can come out, for, as you say, for many, many years, it can come out in, in ways of, uh, you know, stress, anxiety, depression, um, other behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. um, but then it may not come out for a long time because people oftentimes are numb. They're afraid. They're angry. Um, and, and, and the numbness is, is the one that, um, you know, resonates with me because mm. I know a lot of people want to bury things, you know, and, and not let them surface because that's painful. Right. And not right. To if, if the abuser is the person in their family or relating to their family, it affects relationships that they don't want to uh, destroy. I mean, yeah. this is just, the topic is, is so amazing. I mean, I, I bet that every person you talk to can identify one of these predator moments in, yes, in their life. Indeed. Whether it's with a, you know, even if they're teenagers hanging out together, that teenager can be an abuser or yes. you know, a predator. And so all throughout our lives, whether we're a caregiver or even to protect ourselves, I think it's so important to educate everyone, right? And as you say, it does start in the home. Parents, caregivers need to be aware, you know, and not just dismiss something. Don't force a hug. Don't force a kiss. That's right. If Uncle Johnny comes home, you know, you know, and, and the child runs the other way or even their eyes, if their eyes dart away, they don't mm -hmm. want to interact. Like that's an awareness, you know, that they should have. And parents, we have to help our children. You know, my, I'm going to, I'm 50. Ooh, I am 50. I'm, <laughs> I'm 50 now. Um, and our, my parents' generation, they were removed, right? Kids were, they were like, okay, kids, go out and play or go mm -hmm. play in the other room. And we would play in the house and they didn't have eyes on us. And I know that for me, my own children, I, I have more of an eye on them. And, and even just the world we live in, you know, it may not be safe to go out and be as free uh, as we were. So, so I guess to, to have this awareness, you know, in the mission to prevent the child sexual abuse, it's just, you know, one, one story, Yvonne, I, I may have shared it when I interviewed on your podcast. When I was younger, I had a half sister and I slept over her house and I wasn't asleep yet. We were sleeping in a room with two beds and 
um, her father came in and I felt this presence, you know, and it was dark in the room, so I couldn't see his face, but I felt his presence. And, you know, I guess, I guess that's the thing I want to bring to someone's attention. You know, if you let your child sleep over someone's house, you may not know who's in the house. You may not know what goes on. And if, <sighs> if the predators are drinking, doing drugs, hopped up on something, then they're not going to show their true colors when they're when they're sober, when they get dropped off. Oh, hi. OK, yeah. See you later. Well, you know, you, you just don't know not to say that they can't sleep over, but it's something I think that parents need to be more aware that this can happen. Oh, my gosh teenage brother it, it could it doesn't have to be what they might think of right you can look you can pull up on your app the the people who are released from jail right who live in your area but but what what else i mean there's so much that people can be aware of Yvonne, in your expertise what else um do we need to share with the listeners oh my gosh first of all i love that you brought up the app that people can look and see who's in their area because that's very important. But the most important thing and what I want people to understand is the people that you know, love, and trust are the people that are most likely to abuse your children. That's what I want you to hear. It's not stranger danger. You know, it's not people hiding in an alleyway. Um, these are people that you know. And the reason that is, is because getting to a child is a process. You know, you know, and except for those cases of, you know, kidnap and, you know, where they kidnap a child and keep them forever. These strange, you know, strangers, which is very rare or unusual, but, but, so it's important for people to understand that getting to a child is a process. And that process, the very first step <clears throat> normally is to gain the trust of the parent. They have to gain the trust of the parent before they can gain the trust of a child. Because what many people don't understand is the child is looking to the parent as a guide as to who they should trust. So, if, you know, this person gains the trust of the parent, well, of course I can trust this person too, right? Because my parent trusts this person. But the things that we have to look out for with these people is they gain the trust of the parents, and that's when they start maybe asking for quality time with the child, whether it be through music, sports, video games, whatever it, it is they will find a common interest that they can use to get closer to the child. And when they find that common interest, that's then an excuse to take the child away from the parent. Oh, can, you know, Tommy come play video games today at my house? Hey, can Tommy go um, on an overnight trip with me so we can go see this band that we both really like? Oh, hey, can... Tina, you know, can she come spend the night and watch movies with me because we like the same movies? The first thing that you know that I need to tell you that you need to know is that if any adult wants to be alone with your child, you need to ask yourself why. How many adults do you know have children come to their house to play video games with them. That is not a normal relationship between your child and an associate, someone that you know. Now, this is where it gets tricky because if it's family, this is trickier, okay? It's trickier because you're supposed to trust your family. And what's wrong if, you know... Uncle so-and-so and aunt so-and-so, you know, want to spend the night with, you know, their niece or nephew. That shouldn't be wrong, right? Well, it depends. Is this someone that your child has a relationship with? That you see how they interact with one another? 
Is this someone who lives close by and, you know, that, you know, it's not just him going there, but it's other people going there potentially and playing games too. Um, so we yeah, want to... Let's, let's remember, I just want to interject here, the people who are doing the abuse, this is something that's, it could have happened to them. And this is a generational thing that yes. propagates down through the generations. And so yes. this is, you know, imagine if you yourself was abused and you're afraid to come out or you've been numb to it. And maybe your, your brain is, is such that you're attracted to someone young because of what happened to you. Mm -hmm. now, you know, I might say, Hey, that's, that's not normal. And in this world we live in normal is not something that really can be defined today. Right. People are, well, in the process of yes. gender, being different, and that's accepted everywhere. You know, it's it's very common in a lot of ways. But I think we can all agree that if taking advantage of someone is not acceptable. No. That's, that's something that we have to be mindful of. Um, you know, and I'm actually glad that you brought that up because... You know, people say, well, it's hard to know. Actually, it's not hard to know because there's normal curiosity when it comes to children. Children have normal curiosity. You know, it's not a red flag necessarily if your child, you know, if they come into the bedroom while you're changing and they stare at you at your private parts or make comments about your private parts or interested in touching your private parts because that's completely new to them. And they're learning that way. Now, the difference is, is it every single time you're naked? Is it every, you know, is it something that's a problem that even when you're clothed, they're trying to get to you, they're trying to touch you, they're trying to, you know, explore? That's a red flag. It is normal for children to touch themselves. It, that's a very normal thing. And when that happens, you just want to, you know, encourage them to, that's something that they do in private. We don't want to shame them because they are just exploring. And that is a hundred percent normal. <clears throat> you know, so things like that, you can actually research and, and there are, you know, websites out there that'll tell you what, what exactly are, what is normal? What's normal? childhood sexual curiosity because there is just innate curiosity within all of us when we're children about these things but it's if it's <clears throat> interfering with their i guess with their daily activity if if this goes from being curious about mom and dad to they're curious about it with other friends at school now that's a big 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 red flag. Mm. Not that <clears throat> kids won't be interested when they see each other, but just that um, kids do to other kids what's done to them. So that's less of a curiosity and more of a replay of what has happened to them and they want to see how other kids react to it. But the most important thing that I want you to hear from this topic is that most people who have been abused do not go on to be abusers, thankfully. You know, research shows that most do not, but some do. And I've done some research into it, and abusers who go on to abuse are essentially trying to repair what was done to them or reconcile what was done to them. It's not necessarily an attraction. This is what I need to make clear. Um, it's not that these every person is sexually attracted to children. It's so many abusers 
are acting out the abuse that they endured as kids. Um, but one thing that I do want people to look out for is if their child is doing overt sexual things to themselves, such as in the middle of a room, do will they do they bend over? Does your son ever bend over? And this might sound graphic, so a little warning ahead of time, you know, but does he spend, you know, spread his butt cheeks or try to insert something there as a way to play? Because when kids do that in front of you, they're trying to tell you what's happened to them and they do it by reenacting it in front of you. And so this behavior that you might see within your child, this overt sexuality, you know, it could be their way of telling you that they're hurt and they need help. And that's what we need to, to be on the lookout for. You know, I, you know, you, you talk about this, this play, uh, and I have been a behavioral specialist working with children. Um, you know, and I, there was this one child that I had and, you know, one-on-one -on -one I was working with her and then at the, at the daycare I was working with her and I didn't see any signs of anything like that. Uh, but then there was one day when, uh, her sister was home and we were playing um, a game. Or I forget what it was. We were playing a game together and the girl who was four, she got bored of the game and instead she took the game piece and, and you know, mm -hmm. spread her legs and said, I'm going to put this in my mm. vagina. Mm. And I said, where, where did you hear that word? And the mm -hmm. other sister kind of giggled and you know and I said game pieces are for playing the game and then I went on but but hearing this what you just said would that be something to be concerned about a thousand percent a thousand percent a thousand percent yeah. and it and is not normal for children to try to insert objects there right. That is not normal. That's abnormal child behavior. Right, right. And so, you know, I'll tell you, when I first met the the father, it was kind of off-putting to me. He seemed very kind of stern and, and strict and kind mm -hmm. of private. Like, he was asking me, are you leaving now? Like, just... I don't know, and I wasn't. I was getting something from the car. Like, it was not, I had a, I didn't know what the feeling was. The interaction mm -hmm. with him. And the, and the mother, and again, you know, the dynamics in each household is very different, right? So you, and I couldn't say, oh, I don't trust this guy. But deep inside, I felt something there from this guy. Yeah. The woman, the mother was, the false, these were foster parents. Oh my God. And that the, is like double red flag, triple red flag, quadruple red, red flag. flag. It, like intense and intent on getting everything done in her house. Like she was, you know, almost like I was a babysitter there. And, you know, and, and again, I, with the training that we have, you know, we have to kind of explore these things and make sure that the child is fine so yes you know, in my initial meetings with the with the with the kids and with the family I try and ask questions and you know kind of see what the dynamic is and see how they feel about the others in their family so you know again but the but the girl who did tell me her father gives her her back oh oh red flags all over the place Woo red flags this is a foster father right yes and here comes entering things into it's not things it could be right. I, will, I will be making a call digits as as we're done here I'm going to be making yes a call. yes and please do yeah because, you know, 
things might seem innocent enough, you know, as you say, like general curiosity, like, you know, Mm -hmm. I know with my own children, like they would learn names of things and it's like, they would say it and they'd get a shock reaction from the, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like, or, you know, they would giggle and ooh, ha ha ha. (laughs) But, but like you say, if, if it goes beyond that, or if it comes out in play, that's, that's a red flag or it could be, could be, could be, let's say it could be a red flag, you know, and just that's, let's call it, let's call that an orange flag. Right. Something that we need to look into. Now, Yvonne, I want to ask you, there's something here in your book. um, Mm -hmm. And uh, it's on page 53 of the copy that I have. And um, there's a paragraph here and it says, every ounce of my body told me not to go, but my body moved as if it had a mind on its own. And then you mentioned later, I felt apprehensive. And so, you know, I guess I just want to point out that as you, as you've go, went through your journey of, you know, dealing with what happened to you, and I don't want to reveal everything because people, you need to buy her book, The Invisible Girl, a memoir um, by Yvonne Sandemir. Um, Yvonne, this book is available where? Oh, it's available pretty much everywhere. It's available Amazon, um, Barnes and Nobles, everywhere. It's also um, available in Audible as an audio book that I narrated myself. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so this, this, your story is really going to enlighten people, I think. And this can be for caregivers. This can be for, you know, victims who were abused. Um, now, you mentioned at the start of our show, you know, that you, you had child trauma of many types yes yes and so I just feel like that's important to mention so anybody can can learn from oh learn absolutely from. i my uh traumas uh sexual abuse incest um witnessing dom- domestic violence which i learned is a trauma physical abuse um domestic violence with my own partner, um, multiple rapes, multiple uh, molestations, multiple incestuous things from multiple family members. So is that always the case in a, in a family? Would you say of, you know, that those things like the domestic violence, and multiple like multiple people in a family is it it's is it common i would say it is common because trauma especially with incest is generational it's generational and again you know that person that abused me i wonder who abused them and then on from there, who abused them and who abused them and who abused them. It's a within families, it is a thousand percent generational. And actually on my next podcast, I'm going to be talking about a documentary that I found so fascinating called Rewind that um, is a man's story of being raped um, by his uncle. And it just does a great he does a wonderful job of pointing out the red flags, pointing out his, the points in his life where he was acting out. And what's really cool about this is that the story is told through old home videos throughout his life. So you'll see him as a kid, not knowing, you know, that he's being abused And then you find out during all of those tapings, he was actually being abused and the people, they were all around him. And when I watched it, I was like, every red flag was there. I mean, everything is just so educational. So I'll be talking about that on my next podcast because, you know, a couple points that I want to make about this. If an abuser gets your child alone, they will abuse your child. 
that's when they will attack. They don't wait till the next time they get them alone. It's the first time. So that's one thing that I want to leave people with. That, uh, yeah. The other thing that I wanted to say is that survivors beat themselves up a lot because of normal negative after effects that they have from their traumas. And this, you know, going back to what you talked about earlier about behaviors that we have, I want people to understand that this doesn't make them bad people, that they're having normal after effects to abnormal behavior. You know, a lot of people that we look at and say, oh, they're promiscuous, so they just must be whores. No, they could be being promiscuous because it's the only way that they feel love. Maybe that's, they're feeling unworthy and they're trying to get all of that worth back that they didn't have as a child that was stolen from them from their abusers. So I want people to be kind to themselves <laughs> and compassionate. And that's the most important thing for survivors that I want them to hear. And I wanted to say that before I forgot. Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. So uh, listeners, if you have uh, joined late, I just want to kind of recap a little bit about what we've been talking about. Um, Yvonne Sandemir uh, is an author with a memoir called The Invisible Girl, available um, on Amazon and mo most places where books are sold. Um, Yvonne is a survivor of deep childhood trauma. Um, unfortunately, she was a victim of rape and multiple molestations, incest, um, she had physical abuse and as well uh, witnessed domestic violence, all very traumatic things. A lot of times those tra traumas are um, generational and they happen, you know, from one generation to the next. She has a mission to prevent child sexual abuse through awareness. And she has a podcast called Survivor Strong which is a live podcast and you can listen to that. You can join in on the conversation. She's hoping that people will come forward. Um, survivors, be kind and compassionate with yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Your behaviors are oftentimes normal after effects of abnormal behavior. Um, and for those people who are, listening and you know this might be a new topic to you just know that predator red flags will tell if a person is not safe um and it's so important because there's long-term effects um after someone is abused um and and again that may not show up you might be angry you might be numb you might be afraid you may have physical symptoms such as anxiety upset stomach you might be acting out in certain other ways. Um, if you're promiscuous, it might be the way that you're trying to reclaim that worth that you lost if you were abused as a child. And folks, this starts as a toddler. Like if a toddler doesn't want to engage or interact with a family member or someone, don't say, oh, it's just a hug. Oh, it's just a kiss. Give them a kiss. You know, like, no, don't, don't make them do that. Um, don't make the girl and boy hug either or the, you know, yes. that's another thing where the kids are, anyway, there's so much to this, Yvonne, we might have to have a part two. I think we might need that because there's so much to it, you know, uh, it's just, there's so much to it. Yes, yes. Um, Yvonne, we're excited to hear that you have uh, plans to do a children's book on boundaries and as well for parents. I think yes. that would be a wonderful compliment. Um, to your story. Now, 
um, the other thing that Yvonne has educated us on is that uh, getting to a child is a process and people that you know, love and trust are the danger. It's not the people hiding out in the alleyway, jumping out, stealing and grabbing you, although that might happen. So be mindful everywhere you go. Yes, still. <laughs> um, you know, if they find they can gain your trust as a parent, you know, the adult, they would gain your trust to be with your child and do something that you both enjoy, like a video game or a movie or going to a place. Um, they find an excuse to take the child away, get them alone, and then they will abuse them the first time. It's not something where they'll wait and do it, you know, later. Um, they would take advantage of the child's curiosity, perhaps. And, you know, they, anyway, just it's something that, you know, you should research online what is normal curiosity for, you know, children uh, at that age versus, you know, what are the red flags that you can be mindful of to protect your child? Um, Yvonne, we, I know that we're running short on time, but do, do you have a few moments to, to read from your book? Sure. Yes. Let me just grab uh, one. Sure. Cause I be happy to. Love to hear it. I know that, you know, there's another at the end, near the end of her book, there's a certain topic which, um, you know, is, is just amazing that really kind of sheds light to, to talking about your feelings, dealing with it and using your support system. So, you know, I just want to put this out there. If you've been abused and you haven't come forward and you haven't dealt with it, use Yvonne's story and, and experiences to know that you can come out on top, you can deal and you can heal. Absolutely. And that's the most important lesson that I want people to understand is they can absolutely heal and grow from whatever's happened to them. And I think that I'm actually going to read from the final chapter reflections because it, it gives about a lot about my, you know, what I've, what my overall, what I learned overall. And so this is chapter 18 entitled Reflections. It's page, it starts on page 211. <clears throat> I realized that if I had any chance of being happy at all, I'd have to give in to the healing process. I knew unburdening my past through therapy was the only path to laughter, self-love, awareness, and happiness. Sometimes we just need extra reassurance. We need to know everything is going to be okay. We need to feel safe enough to wax and wane with the flow of our emotions. That vulnerability is an inevitable, inevitable part of healing that no one can ignore. I had that opportunity thanks to my husband and my support system. Don't want to give away the names just yet. Um, I had the time to discover who I am for the first time in my life and move forward from my past. I stepped out of a world that was once so clear into one that seemed unfamiliar. I'm learning new ways to live a life full of love, laughter, and family. I don't know how far you want me to go. One more paragraph. So, yeah, so Yvonne, at, at that, um, I just want to, you know, take a moment that, you know, it's a process. And, and again, as we've mentioned, it's difficult. You may, you know, not want to face those feelings, but imagine that to be able to live with joy and laughter yes. and self-acceptance again, it's, you know, it's important. And for those who might be alone out there, I have to mention my book, Emotional Strength Explained is a good tool that helps you if you're at the beginning stages of dealing with your feelings or emotions, if you're open to making a change. Um, it can really help put things in one place, give you some structure um, to deal with it. You can write in pencil and revise your feelings and thoughts as you go through it, as you um, gain. And it's private. It's not as though you have to divulge this information. So if you're afraid and it's difficult for you, 
you can start using a tool such as this or journaling. You can start by journaling and just really imagining what you want and manifesting it. If you want that peace within yourself, you can have that. Um, so Yvonne's book, uh, The Invisible Girl, a memoir available in audio, audible as well. So that's a yes. uh, yes. nice, easy way to, to listen that if you're not a, a reader. Um, so Yvonne, thank you so much for, for being with me today. Um, we're going to look to have a part two of this. Um, Wonderful. Yes, yes. And um, send me the name of that documentary. Yes, I will send that to you, that information. And I, I'll be discussing it um, on Wednesday. So if you have time, you can hop on and hear about it too. Um, but the, the documentary is entitled Rewind. And, you know, just for anybody else out there that might want to, let me just tell you who it's by because his name is a little unusual to join on Wednesday. What is the, the, um, the address of your podcast where they can find you? Oh, that's great. Um, actually they can find me on fireside and they can just find me using Yvonne Sandemir as my, that's my tag. And the podcast is again, survivor strong. Wonderful. So this week on Wednesday, uh, she'll be discussing the podcast rewind, um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful example. So join her podcast this Wednesday. And what time is that? It's at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And before we go, I just want to mention that Rewind, the director is Sasha Joseph Newlinger. And that's N-E-U-L-I-N-G-E-R. Just so you have the full information about the documentary. So, Yvonne, we'll, we'll look forward to your podcast this week. Um, remember, folks, you can join. It's a live podcast. Join the conversation. Um, we're looking to spread awareness on this important mission to prevent child sexual abuse. Um, you know, Yvonne, thank you again. Thanks for, for writing your book, telling your story, and for being a guest. Um, and again, we're looking forward to, to what comes next for you. And definitely need to meet with you again. We need to talk about other topics. I agree. Yeah. And I agree. A thousand okay. percent. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Yvonne. Thank, thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. Thank you so much. Thank you.